Our guest in this segment is Delegate Don Forst. And uh, uh, Don joins us via telephone from the Capitol. He is the delegate from the 91st District. He is the vice chair of political subdivisions, also serves on GovOrg, Health and Human Resources, Jails and Prisons, Workforce Development as well. Don, good morning to you, sir. How are you doing? Hey, uh, good morning to you guys. Your, your, your phone faded for a moment, but it made a brief comeback, so I think we have you there still, right? Oh, okay, good. Uh oh! Nope. <laughs> <laughs> can just this is never a good momentum builder when you when you run in my office. We call that being t mobile Yeah, I think you have been, man. All right, I think we still have you there, Donnie. Can you still hear me? I think yeah, I hear you guys fine. Excellent. Am I coming through okay? Yeah, you're doing much better there. Right. All right. Uh, let, let's talk first and foremost about the uh, Department of Health and Human Resources. Uh, obviously, you serve on that committee. And this was, uh, going into the session, the biggest focus until the dueling tax cut plans came out and sucked all the oxygen out of the room. But before, before we get to tax cut plans, let's talk about uh, DHHR and, and tell me what's the latest from your perspective as to what's going to happen. Well, at this point... Uh, the bills have passed, uh, and it's over to the department to implement the things that was required of them. And my impression is uh, try to micro. We basically specified some basic splits that seem very logical, giving them a lot of organizing within those basic splits, the, the health, the and then the hospital operations. And, uh, and that's, uh, it's, the planning is underway. It takes effect, I believe, at the fiscal year, but they're doing their Hey, Don, I'm sure he was very succinct yeah. there, but... Don, can you, I'll tell you what, just, you know, just let's hang up and call me back. We need to reestablish your signal because when you're strong, you're great, and then you kind of just fade out and come back. Can, can you do that? Sure, I'll call you right back. Yeah, call me right back. Yeah, okay. Now, we're we're going to try that again because I don't think we're going to be able to fight that for 20 no. minutes. In some ways, it's better to burn out than to fade away. And you know how phones always fade out at some of the most important words. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. And the Powerball is, <laughs> I got five, I got five. Wait, wait, wait. We, were, we could play Mad Libs there. We got like every other word we could just fill in. Oh, mercy. All right, so. Take care of that myself. All right, Donnie, I think we have you back now. Can you hear me? I'm too better. I, I don't. I, I didn't. Uh, uh, we'll see. Where? Where are you? Are you calling from the basement? Give me a. No, that's no, that's actually worse. Somehow that signal even got to be worse. <laughs> how how close are you to your office? I can't. Office. Floor. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Your signal is actually worse than it was before. We have Don Forrest, delegate, coming to us from underwater. Can I'll tell you what. Can you call me from your office? Are you anywhere close to your office? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Call yeah. me back on your landline from your office. Okay. Let me give that a shot. Just right. a minute. Thank you. Because... <laughs> That, that, that usually you don't get worse when you right. call back. It usually gets better. That was actually like ten times worse. If you're looking for like a worse multiplier, spin the wheel. That's the worst one right there. And I, I mean, I, I said something bad about T-Mobile because I have T-Mobile and they're bad. <laughs> um, the service has actually gotten a lot better recently with T-Mobile. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting lectured by by Chris Strovel. Who's saying only landlines? He's got a desk phone. You call him. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I know, wow. Granddad. I know. <laughs> I know. It, it it averts. Chris is sitting there uh, recording the show on the woolen sack today. Don't you have some federal people to help? <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the deal. We were batting pretty well with uh, cell phones out of the Capitol this year. That was the first bomb that blew up in our face on the. Uh, on the cell phones out of the Capitol. It's a notoriously horrible place for cell reception, mm -hmm. by the way. All right, so now. I wonder if that's purposeful. All right. Donnie, how about now, now that you're on a landline? Oh, okay. You got me okay? Yeah, that's yes, where we sir. <laughs> okay. That's where we should have began. Yeah, struggle, okay. struggle was right. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Um, we were talking about the, uh, what, well, from our perspective, what's going on. Basically, 
we send over them a requirement to split into three parts. Mm -hmm. And we're giving them a lot of leeway in organizing within those things under some broad guidelines. And that's what they're doing now. They're in the process of doing that. And then it takes effect, I believe, at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, which would be what, uh, July 1 or so, about mm -hmm. that time frame. And I think that a lot of the problems in that, I mean, that that department probably spent half the state's money to throw in all the uh, the grant money that we, we manage and distrib distribute. And so it, it's a critical group, but they've somehow... They've kind of, I'm not sure if they've kept up with the times or they have low morale or they have some different problems that are not just organizational. I think the whole organization needs a morale boost, needs a little bit of energizing, and I'm hoping that with the attention given to them now that that's what will happen. Some of their systems, they're modernizing and adding in more things, uh, uh, what they call dashboards to help them run their operations better, particularly in the foster care areas. They're making a lot of innovative upgrades to how they do things and the tools they use. So we're all cautiously optimistic that things are going to improve steadily. And, uh, and that's sort of where it is now. We've kind of punted to them. We're going to see what they come up with on some of the details. And then we do have a review responsibility. And hopefully it'll all start to mend and be do, do better in the next fiscal year. Very good. I have a request to ask you about a bill you have that requires students to know English before entering school. <laughs> okay. I'm co-sponsoring that with one of my friends who is a school teacher. He needs, he, he's experienced and he feels that just throwing kids into a class where they don't understand a thing that's going on, don't speak the language, isn't the way to deal with ha uh, handling these kids. They need some kind of preparation or English as a second language or something before we just throw them into a class and have them sit there and be bored to death. And so that was the intent of the bill, mm -hmm. to rectify this problem where we were required to put them in school and, and but we don't prepare them. We just throw them into a class where they just all they're doing is twiddling their thumbs and ha are oblivious to what's going on around them. Um, now, that's not the case for every student that we take into our schools like that, but it happens often enough that it really is distracting to the teacher or as they start to learn a little bit of the language, they take an undue amount of the teacher's attention at the expense of all the other students. And so... The intent is let's prepare those kids a little more, get their language skills up so that they get more benefit from the classes and don't distract the attention of the teacher too much from all the other students. So does the bill provide for an English education type system for these kids before they are then accepted into the grade? Not, not that explicitly, and I've had some interesting discussions with people. They say, well, it just get some English uh, as a second language teachers in there. And I said, well, wait a minute, you, we can't put one of those teachers in every classroom. What we have to do is put those kids through a few preparatory courses so before we try to mainstream them. Let's take them aside and uh, bring them up to a level where they can at least communicate and they're not just sitting there oblivious to what's going on around them. And so... That has to be worked out a little bit in the schools, and every school situation is different depending on how many of these students they have and what level they're at. So the schools are going to have to take a little bit of initiative in how to set this up, but they just can't throw the kids, mainstream them, throw them into classes where they're just oblivious to what's going on around them. And then another bill about having superintendents of school districts elected as opposed to hired. Um. That's, that's an attempt to get parent influence more into the school system. And uh, that's a big concern. We hear from the parents. Uh, we're probably the closest people to parents. And uh, the, the things we've tried to do to improve uh, things in education, we've been accused of trying to take over the education system and dictate things. And that's not the intent at all. 
All we're trying to do is convey parents' concerns on some of the policies and approaches, not to try to dictate curriculum or how they teach. We're not the professional educators. We're the voice of the parents. Well, since we elect the school board and they hire the superintendent, isn't that accountability already present with the election of a school board? It doesn't seem to be, at least not enough to satisfy a lot of people. I mean, it's. Oh, I guess, what are other examples? Uh, we, uh, <laughs> well, we elect the governor and the legislature. Uh, we elect, in a lot of places in the government, we elect both levels. I guess the board acts a little bit as an oversight thing, and you're right, they do hire the superintendent, but a lot of people feel that the board isn't as independent as it should be, and they tend to um, go with mainstream education people and don't reflect a lot of the views of parents as well as they would like. Would you I mean, require it, the superintendent candidates to have degrees in education, advanced degrees in education, or could anybody just run for superintendent? Um, well, being honest, anybody can sign up, and I would expect the voters to be a little use a little bit of discretion in the person. My feeling is they need to have management skills and know how to run an operation because it's not just education they're dealing with. They're dealing with facilities, staffing, uh, non-teaching staff, the teachers, they're really running a big operation and should have some management skills as well as education knowledge. So I wouldn't say that their only credentials they need are educational. They have to have some management skills as well. Matt Miller. Don, let me ask, as far as that particular idea, what would a term be for a superintendent before they would have to then be re-elected into that position? Um, I don't have a strong feeling, and I hadn't considered it. I know that the board members are staggered, and I think they have four-year terms. And then uh, now the superintendent, uh, maybe they should go a little bit longer. Uh, four or six years, possibly. Uh, but I don't have a strong feeling on that. I don't have a recommendation. Uh, it could be every four years. Uh, six years wouldn't be bad. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. I don't no. have a good answer on that. It's 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 a ballpark, and that's what I was wondering. You know, would a, an elected superintendent only have, say, two years to really prove themselves, so to speak, or maybe changes or things that they were implementing? Really, you couldn't judge how those went within that short period of time. They might get elected out by the time any of those results come in. So I was just wondering about a length of time. Oh, that's a valid point. I mean, the, probably maybe the four years is a minimum. Six years might be reasonable. Um, maybe a, a six year with some provision for recall if things would, really went south fast. <laughs> yeah, right. But but you have a good point. It takes a while to to make changes and have them work through a system, particularly something the size of some of our school systems. Mm -hmm. Take us back. Uh, you, you, earlier, you were giving us the three departments and how DHHR was being broken down, and the phone was kind of glitchy at the time. What What are those three departments again? Okay. The health is just more or less the traditional health in terms of uh, public health, and then a lot of the regulations and oversight that we provide in, in, to that industry. Uh, the second major area is the human resources, which gets into uh, some of the welfare that the, um, the kids um, dealing with uh, adoptions and uh, foster children and all, and all the human side of things. Uh, and that's a logical grouping and they're related. The third area is hospitals, where we're actually operating hospitals. My personal feelings on that is that we shouldn't be in the business running, the government shouldn't be in business actually competing against the private sector. Our people aren't professional hospital administrators, and we don't do a really a good job. I think that those should be spun off over time and put into the private uh, sector, and where we just do the oversight and set some of the requirements and so forth and rules 
but let them be uh, totally out in the private sector. They could be a nonprofit or for profit, but they, we shouldn't be in the business of competing against our own, our own industries in the state. I didn't realize we had hospitals that were being operated through DHHR. Uh, five or six. Okay. Uh, four of them have been problem children. Some of them have to do with uh, mental health or some of the people that are committed. Some deal with uh, elderly people that are basically have no family or home or income, and they're just sort of, that's the old traditional old people's home in a sense. Uh, but a little more modern, not as bad as that sounded. <laughs> are, are, you, <laughs> are you still planning, will, will there be one head, if you will, over the entirety of DHHR with three department chairs, so to speak, answering to that one? Or is this a breakup into kind of three separate departments with their own heads that, that kind of work their part of what they're doing? Right now it's three separate uh, that could change again down the road, depending once things stabilize and get better. Is it if it looks like there's an advantage to combining them, that would be fine. Uh, but if they're operating fine separately, you know, I don't think that's in, locked in concrete, so to speak. Uh, that the, right now they're set up as three separate entities and are being looked at and managed somewhat independently. But it could change in the future. Let me get back to the school stuff, the school boards. You had said, you know, the, the supervision is a, of the school boards over the superintendents. You used the phrase basically, a, you know, roughly a little bit. Aren't all of the school boards in our state elected by the people and by, you know, parents who are part of the people? Uh, that tends to be true. Actually, it is true. I think the problem is they... Uh, occur during the primaries that aren't well uh, people don't pay a lot of attention and I think that what happens in a lot of areas unless there's some issue or something going on people just tend to let things go they don't get too riled up about it well, and so the, the basically the school boards become inbred it's all former teachers or people that are professional educators or people who have a, an interest, and there tends to be a strong bias towards the traditional approaches. Well, people are usually uh, people that join boards usually are people who are interested in that particular field or interested in helping society. No, not, no argument there, but um, it, I guess I'll give a personal view on that. It, it, it tends to be overly influenced uh, by the teachers associations and unions and things who rally the troops and vote their people in and so it's tends to not be reflective of the general population but of a special interest group but wouldn't they uh, Don wouldn't they do the same sir if uh, if we were electing a superintendent and you'd at one point you said you know you didn't believe they had to have an education background to be superintendent but then a little later, we were talking about DHHR, and you said it's important to have a professional hospital administration. What uh, sort of what sort of credentials would somebody who was running for, like like when people are elected judge, you can't be an auto mechanic and run for circuit court judge. You have to be a lawyer. You have to have experience in that field. What sort of, uh, I mean, in an elected superintendent, what, what sort of experience would you require? Um, well, okay some familiarity with the education field or coming up through it, but I think they need to have some demonstrated management skills uh, because it's as much a management job as it is an education job at that level. Uh, okay, it's, you know, and even if somebody was a very, very successful school teacher and ran for that position, they may not be the best qualified if they don't have any business experience or experience in managing a large organization. Um, same with the hospital administration. That tends to be a specialty area. And it's, a, it's a management job. In other words, the administrator of that hospital doesn't have to be a doctor. It has to be somebody who knows how to run the business and manage the doctors and the nurses and all the other support staff. In other words, they need a broader overview. They can't just be a specialist in the primary service of like, you know, like the, being a doctor or being a teacher on the education side. In other words, this, the requirements are broader than just 
the service being delivered. You have to deliver the service effectively. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Don, we're just about out of time. Anything that uh, you wanted to bring to the attention of our audience in regards to things you're otherwise working on or hope passes in this session? Um, Well, actually... But I, I am on the political subdivisions. Let me just share a bit of my beliefs and philosophy. This is personal. Mm-hmm. I think that we have to delegate more responsibility down to the counties and cities. We spend an inordinate amount of time micromanaging the political subdivisions. I think it's time to start passing some of that responsibility down, a little bit of some taxing authority, as well as a little more say of how they run their lives. And and I do this for two different reasons. One, the diversity between our counties in terms of economy, population, and rural versus urban, or having some decent, no larger towns versus no large towns, it's hard to come up with laws and rules that apply uniformly and benefit everybody equally. It just doesn't happen. And so I, we have to get used to the idea that we're going to have to let the counties have a little more say-so over their own lives. So that's one thing that I'd like to start the conversation on and get people thinking about that, because it's going to be a transition over a period of years and maybe have a few pilot counties try things out and see how they work before we try to extend it to everybody. So that's sort of a personal goal of of something I think we need to deal with uh, in the longer range. Uh, The other thing, if I still have a couple seconds here, is we didn't really hit the tax as much. Yes. I'd just like to say that I'm leaning heavily towards the Senate approach uh, for several different reasons. Uh, I think we need to modernize our our tax system, and I'm really sad that we... The amendment on the property tax was killed. Uh, the governor has been tr- talking about, oh, let's just sh- administratively let them deduct it against their, uh, take it off their income taxes and all, but that's going to be an administrative nightmare. Uh, we, we need to give relief to the income tax, both business and personal, but we also need to do some things that help our businesses be more competitive with uh, business outside the state as well as attract people in. In other words, it's got to be a balanced approach. It can't be all one or the other. I've heard rumors that somebody did a survey and most of the people favored income taxes versus uh, lowering income taxes versus property taxes. And I'm thinking a lot of the people aren't into the economy enough to realize how critical it is to get these businesses in so they have the jobs to make the income. It's not one or the other. It's got to work together. It's got to be an integrated approach. Uh, And we can't just go all one direction or another. Uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but I like the Senate approach because it is more balanced. It also doesn't just jump in and do a major tax cut. It's, It's does it more uh, incrementally with clear-cut points where we can afford to take the next step, you know, and not mm-hmm. have to back up or, you know, undo something or increase taxes. I think it's a more measured approach, and I think in the long run we'll be happier with that than the, the, the knock it, you know, cut out 30% or 50% all in one fell swoop and then run into problems. Don't the, on on that note, we're out of time. I appreciate your availability this morning. Oh, hey, I always enjoy talking with you guys, and uh, thank you. Thanks for being on. And, Don, remember, next time, use your desk phone. <laughs> yes, sir. I will do that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>